Lord. You know, I think we ought to stand up again. Go ahead, you'll get to be seated for plenty of time. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I think we ought to thank God that we have a paid for church bill. Don't you think? Lord, we thank you so much for giving us this church property, giving us this fine building, all this equipment, all this stuff, this land, these offices. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And you paid for it. Thank you, Lord. We're not having to make payments. We're not paying interest. Thank you. Thank you. We give you all the glory, all the praise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Are you thankful? So thankful. Glory to God. Well, you can be seated. I just... I thought we ought to do that again. You know, anything or anybody in your life that you are not thankful for, you're in danger of losing. Now, that's a whole other message. But a part of being a good steward is that you are thankful. You are appreciative. Because when you're not thankful then you start mistreating and not taking care of, right? And um, uh, a key to greater and more is being a good steward with what you have. I know when I first started in the ministry, Phyllis and I just were broke as could be. I had uh, two little uh, thin dress pants, and two little thin sport coats. And I wore them till I got tired of looking at them. <laughs> you know, and I, of course, the longer you wear them, the worse they look. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, I had learned enough about confession to I'm claiming better, and I'm claiming, you know, more and better. And then I'd, 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 I'd go to get dressed and I'd gripe about my little uh, thin sport coat and pants. Of course, you know what you could mix and match. <laughs> Limitedly. And uh, so, you know, and one day, I, you know, I looked in my little closet again. I started to get it out. Which one am I going to wear today? This one or this one? Or I could match switch the pants, you know. And... Um, I'm kind of griping, and the Lord said, uh, uh, gripe and faith don't work. And and I I realized it's two vastly different things. You you cannot be in faith and be complaining. It's just two, one is foreign to the other. He said, what would you have if you didn't have this? I said, well, I guess I'd be in my T-shirt and blue jeans. This is better to preach in than that, right? You must be thankful for what you have. But that doesn't mean you can't believe for better. But the two go together, right? And you can tell it like somebody's believing for a new car. That's fine. That's great. But then they let the one they got just go to nothing. They won't even wash it. I mean, it's got, uh, uh, you know, six months of McDonald's papers in the back. You better thank you, Lord, for my new car. No, no, you're not ready for a new car. Because whatever you're doing with what you have right now, that's what you would do with the next. You might say, Brother Keith, why are you talking about that? Our church. God wants to add to us. He wants to multiply us many fold. Did you hear me? I said, well, Brother Keith, how big do you think Branson is? It's bigger than you know. 
How many of you don't live in Branson? Raise your hand. Look at that. Look around. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> That's most of the church. <laughs> so now we need to reach out to Branson. <laughs> <laughs> there are hundreds of thousands of people within driving distance of this church that are not going to church anywhere and need God. They don't know how badly they need God. And we can't, you know, take care of everybody, but we could take care of 10 times what we're doing. But the key to increase is faith and stewardship. What we're doing right now with what we have is the same thing we'd do with 10,000 people. Did you hear me? And if we're not taking good care and doing a good job with the resources and the facilities and the money and the people we have, we're not ready to be increased. In your life, if you're not doing the right thing with your extra 20 and 50 and 100 and with your extra hour, then you don't qualify for more. Thank you for those two <laughs> reluctant amens. <laughs> it's a fact. God is huge on stewardship, right? Remember what he said, if you're faithful in little, you'd be faithful in much. If you're unfaithful in little, you'd be unfaithful in much. That is just a fact. So how do we qualify for more? We do everything we know how to do and do the best we have and take the best care of what we have right here, right now. And as we do, God sees that and he sees our heart and that's faithfulness and we qualify for more, to be increased. Can you say amen? amen. <clears throat> Think about that because you have a big part of that. Uh, here soon we're going to be talking more about the, the service teams and more people uh, need to get interested in being a part of a service team so we can uh, do more for more people. We can take care of more. We've got to have, I mean, uh, we've we got to have backups and backups to our backups. We need to think uh, almost like the military. You know, in the front lines, if one guy goes down, there should be four others to take his place, just like this, right? Already trained and ready and committed, and that's the way it's supposed to be with us because we are to endure hardness as good soldiers of the Lord. So think about these things. Pray about them. Stir yourself up. And when you see some of these things coming up the next few months, and uh, you, you'll get some light on it today, I believe. But uh, be ready to serve where you should. And we are going to qualify for more in our personal lives, in our families, in our businesses, and in this ministry. Would you go to James, the fourth chapter, please, this morning? James chapter 4. And ushers... Would you take the aisle? And if you didn't bring a Bible with you this morning, would you raise your hand? Maybe you got several at home, but you didn't bring a Bible. Use one of ours. Raise your hand. Let the ushers wait on you. Take, take a Bible here and turn to James chapter 4. Thank you, Master. We're still praying about our earlier service, and uh, if you know of people that are needing to get to work by a certain time on uh, uh, Sunday morning like this, they're not here because they're working, and you know the times, let us know. Turn in some of that information at the uh, uh, information area out there, uh, you know, what time you know that you or somebody else has to be to work in town. We're going to be led, but I'd like to know what's going on as well. We want to uh, make this earlier service available to people who might not be coming because of their work. Uh, James 4 and verse 6, let's read. James 4 and 6. But he, God, gives more grace. 
Wherefore he says, God resisteth the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Say that out loud. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Who gets the grace? Does it make any difference whether you get grace or not? It makes all the difference. You can't do anything in the things of God without the grace of God. You can't do anything in your life the way it ought to be done and could be done without the grace of God. Grace includes the ability of God, the strength of God, the wisdom of God, the favor of God. It's one of the big words of the New Testament. When you said grace, you said a lot. Who gets the grace? Then should you be interested in being humble? Yes. Uh, I, I, this is an a area that I have studied for a number of years now because the Lord ministered to me as a boy about this. Uh, reading Numbers 12 and verse 3 as a, uh, in my early teens, uh, I read where it says, Now the man Moses was meek above all the men that were on the face of the earth. And as I read that sitting in a chair, the Lord spoke to my heart. I don't mean I heard a voice now, but inside me, he said, Keith, did you notice Moses was the meekest man, the most humble man in his generation? I thought, yep, that's what he said. I, I saw that. He said, did you also realize he's the most used man of me in his generation? Well, that's without question. Moses was the most used man of God, most used, most humble. Most used, most humble. Most humble would mean most grace. Well, that's why he was the most used. Had the most grace. Right? And I began at that point endeavoring to find out what is humility. And as I went along, I found out so many things it's not. And so many things that people call humility. Did you know that there are many Christians that are actually proud of how humble they think they are? I mean, it's, it's deception. It's confusion. And then so many people that don't look at the word at all, to them, meek means weak. And they just don't like the sound of it. They don't like the idea of it. I'm not anybody's doormat, and I'm not a little meek, weak. Jesus is the meekest of all. Would you call him weak? He said, come unto me. He said, learn of me. I am what? Meek and lowly of heart. He wasn't weak. In fact, the most proud is the weakest. People are so proud and they're so pushy and arrogant because they're insecure. They don't know who they are. They have to try to push. They feel like they have to try to push something forward because they're weak within themselves. Truly humble people are strong people, like the master. They're not trying to prove anything to anybody. They are secure in him, and they know that they can't do anything on their own. They're completely dependent upon God helping them in every area of their life. And it's not a matter of trying to be humble. It's just reality. I have to have his help every day, every way. Right? So God does what with the proud? You don't want to be resisted of God. You want to be received and you want to get His grace. So you must be humble. Now verse 7, read it. What does it say? Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now let's go over this again. Who is the understood subject here? Who is to submit their self to God? Who's going to make you submit to God? Who's going to submit you to God? I must submit myself. Right? To God. Who's going to resist the devil? What's the understood, understood subject here? Resist the devil. We know in the English language the understood subject is you. You submit yourself to God. You resist the devil and he'll flee from God. Mm -mm. 
From what? You. You. There's a lot of you in this verse. You submit yourself to God. You resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Who's going to do it? I am. If I don't submit myself to God, I won't be submitted to God. If I don't resist the devil, then he won't be resisted. You know, one mistake that people make in, in Christianity is all this praying and asking God to make the devil stop. I mean, there is untold prayer, God, make the devil quit. And did you know there is not one verse in the New Testament to substantiate that? We're not told. Did you hear how quiet it got? People are like, well, I pray that a lot. I know. <laughs> you got to change. We're not told to pray and ask God to do something about the devil. Or make the devil quit. Or make the devil stop. It's not there. He told us to do something. You resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Is that the same thing as begging God to make the devil quit? No, sir. It's not. Now, if you don't think you like that, don't take my word for it. I insist that you don't take my word for it. Yeah. Get in the Bible. Find your verses. Amen. Prove what you think you believe. Well, this is what brother so-and-so said. That don't count. Amen. Well, mama always said, sorry, but no. In here. Yes. In here. Yep. And of course, we live in the new covenant today. Now, he went on to say, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. What's the next verse say? Draw what? Nigh, draw, near draw nigh or near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn. Weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves. He says it again. In the sight of the Lord. And what? He will lift you up. In the kingdom of God, the way up is down. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, in the way of the world, it's self-promotion. The more you push yourself forward, the more you get yourself out there. Right? <laughs> well, some folk didn't like that either. <laughs> but in the kingdom of God, it's the more you what? Humble yourself. Then, see, you putting yourself forward is you. God lifting you up is another thing. Amen. You promoting yourself is one thing. God promoting you and confirming you is a totally different thing. That was worth some folk coming this morning, just, just that right there. Because we live in a world of self-promotion. And one thing I, I really do not care for People quote it like a scripture. They say, well, you know, it's the squeaky wheel that gets the grease. <laughs> you ever heard that? Yes, well, it's the squeaky wheel, the squeaky wheel. What does that mean? The person that makes the most noise, right? Yes, is that scripture? No. <laughs> what scripture is that? Where's that at? Lord, help us this morning. Some folk don't care for this. Well, <laughs> I can't change the Bible for you, brother. Amen. Right? Amen. No. You humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And in due season, which is always later than your flesh wants it to be, <laughs> He will promote you. He will lift you up. He will make known what he wants to make known about it. And when he does it, it's a door nobody can close. It's something nobody can erase. You can wear yourself out trying to put yourself forward and just come to very little and nothing. 
Read it again. Verse 10. What does he say? Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and what? But to see, that takes faith, doesn't it? To work and be faithful in the background. And don't tell anybody what you're doing. Right? And uh, trust that if God wants to make something known, He can do it. But that takes faith, doesn't it? Well, they're not going to notice me. Well, what if they don't? Nobody's going to know that I did it. Go with me. You're there in, in, in James. Go to 1 Timothy. Let's see. 1 Timothy 5. Y'all believing with me this morning? 1 Timothy 5.24. Notice this. 1 Timothy 5.24. Some men's sins are open, or the word could also be translated shown, made known, beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. Likewise, also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. What is that saying? Sins. Did you know that nobody ever gets away with anything? Ever. He says, oh, Brother Keith, I've seen them. <laughs> it ain't over. <laughs> Some things come out now. Isn't that what he's saying? And other things come out later. Right? And he said, not only with sins, but with good works, it's that way. Right? Some good works are manifested, are shown and revealed beforehand. But the ones that don't come out now, what did he say? They cannot be hid. And really people that understand, they just as soon theirs didn't come out now. Because <laughs> it's better if it comes out later. <laughs> oh, a few people got that. What are you saying? Well, nobody knows what I'm doing. God knows exactly what you're doing. He keeps good books. Well, I don't think anybody's ever even going to know it in my lifetime. Great. It'll come out later. He will bring it out personally. Woo. Can you say amen? Is that good? Now, uh, sins and bad stuff. You want to get that dealt with now. <laughs> you don't want that coming out later. You want to repent, get it straight, get it right now. Jesus said if you'll judge yourself, you won't be judged. Man, that's good news. So yeah, let's get it tight. No matter how much crying we got to do or how embarrassed we are, let's get it taken care of now. Now, get it under the blood so that later we just... Talk about the good works that needs to come out, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, go with me, if you would, to the book of Hebrews. We're there close by. Hebrews, the second chapter. We've been talking about submission, and I have given you one definition of submission, but let's, talk, let's go into some detail this morning about what submission really is. And when I say this, I'm, I'm talking about godly submission. We gave you the word in, in the scripture, the words from the Greek is translated submit, and sometimes it's translated subject, and it's a military word used in military language, it literally means to rank or arrange under. And we've talked about in some detail 
is their rank in the kingdom of God? And uh, you'd have to agree that there is if you look at the scripture properly. I mean, Jesus himself said, my father is greater than I am. Spirit of God said, I don't, he didn't speak of himself. And, and the scripture said that Jesus, once everything's under his feet, he's submit himself unto the father. And angels, is talked about archangels and angels that are under other angels, demon spirits, principalities, powers, rulers. There's right in the kingdom of God. He talks about ministry gifts, first this, second this, third this. And, and the scripture says repeatedly, so and so submit yourself to these. These submit yourself to these. What does that mean? Give them their place over you. You take your place under them. Now, we've already said, that doesn't mean somebody in a place over you is a better person than you or a superior person or necessarily smarter than you. Some of us say, well, if they're not smarter than me, why should they be over me? Because God gave them that place. And if he gave them that place, they're going to have grace to do what other people would not have to do in that place. And though you may not be able to respect everything, that a person in authority says or does, you must respect the place. Or else wise, you fail to respect what God has done. That's why we see we read about it. Paul, the high priest, you remember, commanded him to be smitten in the face. And he says, God's going to smite you, you whitewashed wall. And then, and then they said, do you talk this way to God's high priest? He basically apologized there publicly. He said, I didn't know it was the high priest. Why would you apologize to somebody acting devilish like this? He says, because it is written, you will not speak evil of the ruler of your people. Why? Because you've got to respect that place if you're going to respect God. David and Saul, you remember that? Saul is a demon-possessed man, has tried to kill David, tried to throw a spear through him several times. And David had the opportunity to take his life on more than one occasion. And, and his men said, well, you just stand back. We'll take care of him. He said, no, no, you won't. No, you won't. We will not touch and lay a hand on God's anointed. What? God's anointed? This man's full of the devil. Yeah, but God picked him. God picked him and he put him in that place and his anointing had been on him and he believed that God could take him out of that place if he wanted him, but his hand was not going to be against him. See, we, we have lost so much of that in, as generations have passed one to another, but we must respect what God has done. Romans 13 says there is no authority but what is established of God. Does that mean everybody in authority is right about everything they say and do? Of course not. But the fact that there is a structure is of God. And in the world to come, there will be a structure. Now, some people don't like that, but it's a fact. How many remember Jesus talking about this one ruling over ten cities, this one ruling over five, this one nothing? Right? And uh, people don't realize it, but man, right now, we are either passing or failing tests that will qualify us for less or more in the coming uh, kingdom of God. Man, smart people want to be faithful. Smart people want to pass the test, right? Because it's going to make a difference. Yeah, you'll be saved, but some say, well, if I, if I can just get in, that's all I care about. You say that now. <laughs> but no, you, you want to pass every test. And you want to qualify for all that God would use you for. Because the places are going to be different. And you think some things down here are great when you get used of God. Oh my, in the world to come. And it lasts for eternity. It's real. I said it's real. Well, Hebrews 2, have you found Hebrews? Let's go into some detail about what true godly submission is. Hebrews, the second chapter. Uh, first, of all, I'm going to give you three things as time allows. I'm going to tell you what, what submission is by telling you what it's not. And I think you'll see by that the obvious contrast. First of all, submission is isn't easy. 
I said submission isn't easy. It's not easy. I used to teach this uh, in a course at, at Rama for years. And I don't know at the time, people that were going to get my class maybe in a later term or something, they'd say, oh, Brother Keith, I'm so excited to, to take that class on submission and authority. You know, submission has always been easy for me. <laughs> well, I know right away they don't have a clue. They don't know what submission is because submission isn't easy. Did you hear this now? Have you ever heard somebody say, oh, submission's easy for me. I don't have any trouble with submission. Well, you don't know what it is. <laughs> I'm going to say it one more time. Submission isn't easy. It is not easy. Look in Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2. Oh. <clears throat> Hebrews 2 and verse 8. Talking about Jesus. It says, you've put all things in subjection. That's the word we've been talking about. Submission. Under his feet. For in that he has put all in subjection or submission under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. Do you hear the language under him? See, that's, that is the definition of submit. To rank or arrange under but now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Did you hear this language, lower? Uh, all through here, you see a structure, don't you? Place, higher place, lower place. For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. And it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Perfect through sufferings. Now, verse 14, it says he took part of uh, the nature of the flesh so that through death he could destroy him that had the power of the death, of death. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Verse 18. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted. Now see we see you know suffering. But suffering what? People try to put their own. When they hear suffer a lot of times they'll think well suffering from sickness. Hey, that's not what he said. Sickness is not even mentioned in here. Suffered from what? Being tempted. Can you suffer being tempted? Yes. There are different temptations and different degrees of temptation. Sometimes people will hear about somebody falling in an area of sin and they scoff and say, oh, why, how in the world could somebody do that? I never even have been tempted to do that. Exactly. Did you hear me? See, people say it as a braggadocious thing. They don't realize what they're saying. How many remember the Lord said, was it 1 Corinthians 10? He said, uh, there has no temptation taken you, but as such as is common to man. God is faithful. He will not suffer you or allow you to be tempted above what you're able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Amen. What did he say? He won't allow you to be tempted. See, now, now people have taken that and just thrown all that away and say, well, God won't put more on you than you can stand. That's not what he said. I guess we're kicking over holy cows this morning, man. I mean, <laughs> sacred cows. We've had several of these already this morning. Well, that's what, that's what he said. That's not what he said. No, did not say God won't put more on you than you can stand. So why don't you quit saying that? What do I say? Say what the Bible said. 
what he actually said. He won't allow you to be what? Tempted above what you can, do, basically what you can resist. Right? And so when somebody says, I've never even been tempted in that area. What did they just get through saying? God knew they couldn't even handle temptation in that area. <laughs> and so he, did, he didn't even let one come to them because he knew that it just, poof, that it just fell just like that. <laughs> oh, some folks saw some things in. <laughs> That's what he said. But as you are able to deal with more, then you can encounter greater temptations. Someone says, well, what good is that? <laughs> A lot. Only if you overcome. There is no good if you give in to it and fail. It's just death and destruction. Jesus himself was tempted, wasn't he? How much was he tempted? Absolutely to the max, wasn't he? Go to the fifth chapter. Now keep in mind now, it said he suffered being tempted. Where does suffering come in? Being tempted. Is it a sin to be tempted? No. no. Jesus himself was tempted. Where does the sin come in? When you give in to it, when you yield to it, when you do what you're tempted to do, you act on it. Do you have to give in? Now let's, let's go back to the scripture we quoted. Is it true that anybody could say it was just too much? It just overwhelmed me and I just, it was too much. I couldn't, I couldn't say no. I, I couldn't, I couldn't resist then this scripture we just quoted can't be true that God won't allow you to be tempted above what you're able. No, that's not true. Hebrews 5, Hebrews 5, and verse 5. Christ glorified not himself to make to be made a high priest but he that said to him you're my son today have I begotten you and he said also in another place you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek who in the days of his flesh Jesus when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared though he were a son yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Now we know from the previous chapter he suffered what? Being tempted. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Every time I read that, when I read about him, verse 7, Jesus, this was in the days of his flesh before he went to the cross, he offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears. And we know Jesus was not weak. What's going on here? Well, do you think of a particular passage when you read about crying and tears and prayer and supplication? The garden, don't you? Was he pressed there? He was pressed until he sweat uh, blood, right? What was it over? Now think about it. Specifically, what was, what was he praying about? Don't, don't make it up. Don't fill in, the, fill in the blanks. What was he praying? Father, if it be possible, let this cup, what he's about to go through, let it pass from me. But then what? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. That was the heart of the prayer, and he prayed it repeatedly, the same prayer. Not my will, your will be done. Not my will, your will be done. Again, three times. Not my will, 
your will be done. And he's crying and he's praying and he's in an agony. What's he suffering? What is, what's all the suffering about? He's being tempted. Tempted to what? Not do this. He's being tempted. And he's suffering. This, my friends, is the ultimate example of submission. Right here. This is it. Was it easy? No. Then when somebody says submission is easy, you know they don't know what they're talking about. This is not easy. Can you do it? Should you do it? Yes. Is there great reward when you do it? Oh, aren't you glad he did it? What about us? What if he hadn't done it? Now here's the second thing. Number one, what is it? Submission. Submission isn't easy. It involves suffering. Suffering what? Suffering, having to put your flesh under. What, did, what's, what was the prayer? Not my will, but your will be done. Here's number two. Submission isn't easy. Submission isn't agreement. Submission isn't agreement. Now, this is, this is an area where there's so much confusion in the body. So much. When Jesus, what was his prayer? Jesus' prayer? Not my will, but what? Now, a lot of people don't even want to look at this. They don't even want to believe this. But at this particular point, was Jesus' will the same as the Father's will? If it was, how can you say, not my will, but your will? If his will is the same. See, so people hadn't even wanted to look at this, have they? But Jesus submitted his will to the Father's will. Basically, he said, no matter how I feel about it, or how much my flesh does not want to do it, if this is your will, I will submit to it. I will do it. Is that easy? No. Is that agreement? See, you only have the opportunity to submit when you don't agree. I said you only have the opportunity... To truly submit when you don't agree. Have you ever heard people say this? Well, now usually I submit to them. But on this, I just don't agree. What did they just get through saying? Huh? What they just got through saying is usually I don't have an opportunity to submit. But now I do, and I'm not. <laughs> as long as you want to do what the person over you wants you to do, there's no submission involved. Your will is their will. Hmm? Somebody over you, your boss, your employer, the head of the house, the head of the local church, your head Jesus. Want you to do something, then you think, yeah, that's great. Yeah, let's do it. There's no submission there. That's agreement. It's only when they say, we want you to do this, and you're thinking, uh-uh. <laughs> no, and the more you think about it, no. No, I, uh-uh, I, I prayed about this myself, and I don't know. This is not what I had in mind. No. And your flesh cries out. No. Now it's time to what? Submit. Submit. That's when you have to put your flesh under. You have to bite your lip and you say, uh, yes, sir. We'll do it. Right away. 
Right? Somebody might say, well, Brother Keith, is there, are there any instances where you, where you would be justified in not submitting? Yeah. We'll talk about those as we go. But uh, most people don't need to be focused on that. <laughs> this is the area where they're missing it all the time. See, and if that's the first thought you had when we started talking about this, you're off. You're, always, you're already looking for a way out. Not even willing to do it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, for instance, the disciples. They got called before the leaders. They commanded them not to preach or teach anymore in the name of Jesus. Well, these people are over them. Normally, they should submit. But now what have they done? These leaders are abusing their position. They've commanded these men to do something contrary to what Jesus himself said to do. Well, he outranks them. Right? So in that case, they said, no, we can't do that. Right? But even in that case, you could have a good attitude. Right? But so many times, that's just not the case. Let me go over this again real slowly. Tell me, number one, submission isn't what? It isn't easy. Well, you can see why it's not easy, because of number two. Right? (laughs) Submission number two, what? It's not agreement. It's not, you know, your your will is not their will. It's like Jesus on this occasion. If there's any way, I don't want to do this. Father, all things are possible with you. Let this cup pass from me. But he kept coming back to this. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. And friend, there is no other way to grow up and mature from this. Jesus himself said he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. It was part of his. As a man, he was God from the beginning, but he laid aside his mighty weight and power, and he became like other men, and he developed like other men. And he learned. Did you hear that word? Learned obedience. By what? By suffering, not getting to do what he wanted to do, but yielding his will to the one over him. Now go to 1 Peter, and now we'll read the words of Scripture that say how this works. 1 Peter, and the fifth chapter. You'll see the language he talked about in the first verses of uh, chapter 5, 1 Peter 5, about shepherds. And then verse 4, he says, the chief shepherd. How many know the chief shepherd is over all the shepherds? So really, you know, we're pastors of this church, but we're under shepherds. He's the chief shepherd, and that's true with every church. Receive a crown of glory that fades not away. Likewise, so you see what he's talking about. You younger do what? Submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. That's very similar to what he said in James, isn't it? Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time Now see, this goes together with the next verse. Casting all your care on him, for he cares for you. And if you'll find so much of people's care is about yourself. What people think, or what I need, or what I don't know, and what I don't have. When you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, you just throw all that aside and say, God knows what needs to happen here. And if I'll just humble myself under his hand, if I need to be promoted, he'll promote me. If something needs to be known, he'll bring it out. If not, don't need to be. You eliminate so much of your care by humbling yourself under his hand. 
And he went on to say, verse 9, resist the devil. This sounds very similar to James, doesn't it? And yet it's Peter, another passage. Verse 10, but the God of all grace, who has called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while. Let's see, people will take that verse and they try to make it being sick and being broke. And it's not in this passage. If you keep the context, you'll see that he's talking about submission. He talked about submission in chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 13, submit yourself. Chapter 3, wives, submit yourself. And chapter uh, 4, and now 5, he's talking about submission all through this book. And you'll find he also talks about suffering. We know why now, right? Why? Because true submission involves suffering. Suffering being sick and broke? No. Suffering what? Suffering not getting your way. (laughs) And for a lot of folk, that's worse than being sick. (laughs) That's much worse suffering than being physically sick. Not get my way. (laughs) Woo. There's a story. This is a this is a joke. But a story told about a man that left home and he came back. One of his good friends uh, had a a sign up on his place that Dr. So and so. He said, You're a doctor now? He said, Yep. He said, I found out pay, people will pay big money <laughs> if they're sick and hurting and get, to get well. He said, okay. He left for years. He came back. And, and um, let me see. If I'm, I'm, I'm going to pull a Phyllis here if I don't watch. I'll tell him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I already did. I already did. First of all, he came back and his friend was a preacher. He was a preacher. And uh, he asked him about it. He said, well, you're a preacher. He said, yeah, man, I, you know, I learned how you talk to people right. They'll give you a lot of money. He thought, hmm. And then he came back years later and the fellow's a doctor. And he said, oh, I found out people pay a lot more money uh, to get their body healed than for their soul. And he came back uh, a few years later, and the guy, the sign was changed. It said, attorney at law. (laughs) He said, what? Now you're an attorney? He said, yeah. He said, I found out people pay more money to get their own way than they will for body or soul. (laughs) (laughs) To get their own way. And see, isn't that the big deal with the Lord? Your will or His? Well, He's put people in authority in different places, and submitting to Him includes submitting to them. And that's where the rub comes. Right? Submission. Keep keep reading here. The God of all grace who called us to His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you've what? Suffered. Suffered what? Suffered, you were suffered being tempted to rebel, tempted to be disobedient. Now, now don't raise your hand, no testimonies, but just answer the question in your own mind. Have you ever rebelled? (laughs) Oh, yeah. It's the nature of your flesh. Your unregenerate flesh. Oh, it's... It is the very nature of the devil himself. Rebellion. And you and I must learn within ourselves when that rises up in us. We must learn how it feels at the very beginnings of it so we can can quench it and put it under. Right? Because, you know, don't raise your hand now, but have you experienced it? Do you know what I'm talking about? Something comes up and you go, "Mm mm-mm, I'm not. 
No, I'm not. I don't care what they say. I don't care who they are. Mm Mm-mm. No. Have you ever heard it in little ones? I mean, little ones, they're barely big enough to know anything. And they go, no. (laughs) You got a problem. It ain't cute. That's the nature of Satan. The na- Somebody said, well, are you saying they're the devil? I didn't say they're the devil. I said that is the nature of the enemy. They're yielding to it. And you have to teach them you don't yield to that. And you've got to stay with it as long as it takes. No, I'm not talking about you abusing your child. I'm talking about you not giving in. You don't give in. They've got to give in to you. Did you hear me now? I don't care. I know sometimes it can be tiring. And you come in, you're tired. You don't want to fool with it. I know it. But you've got to do it. You don't give in. Children should submit to their parents. Parents should never submit to their children. Ever. And so what if you're wrong, Brother Keith? That's not submission. You discovered you're wrong. You decided to do something different. You decided. But you're not yielding your will to theirs. Are you with me now? Now you can read somebody else's book if you want to. You ought to ask yourself, what about their kids? Hmm? What about their kids? How'd they turn out? And their kids' kids. The one who wrote this book got more kids than anybody. And he knows how they ought to be handled. (laughs) You never submit to your children. They're supposed to submit to you. Likewise, you younger submit to the elder, he said up there. Verse 10, after you've suffered a while, I'm going to ask you again, suffered what? Suffered being tempted to rebel Now, if you just yield to the rebellion, you're not suffering. You see that? Like, you know, I'd also teach during that course uh, uh, about pride and humility because it goes hand in hand with this. And, And one person told me after the course, they said, Brother Keith, I never used to have any trouble with pride till I took your class. (laughs) I said you don't have trouble with what you yield to it's only when you start dealing with it right it's when you stop giving in and you stop yielding to pride and rebellion here comes the suffering but it's not a bad suffering it's good suffering some things need to be put to death in you right some things need to be crucified in you yeah, but it's, it's me, and it's my personality, and it's me. Yeah, kill it. Kill it. <laughs> it needs to die. It must die. What is the Bible talking about when it says crucify your flesh? What does that mean? Crucify is a harsh word. <laughs> when do we know to pull out the spikes and the hammer? When? When this rebellion starts coming up in you, this, no, no, I ain't gonna. That's when you get out the hammer. Bang. Yes, you are. And you're gonna smile while you do. No, I'm not. Bang. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Is it easy? No. Jesus sweat blood doing this. Can you do it, though? By the grace of God, you can. Is it worth it? Oh. Notice notice the results right here. After you've suffered a while, what happens? Make you perfect. Establish you. Strengthen you. Settle you. What is it? All this bespeaks maturity. Christ-likeness. 
You're not moved by every wind and wave of doctrine and every feeling of your flesh and every little temptation. You become like a mighty tree whose roots go down deep. Oh, hallelujah. Like the house that's built on the rock. You become perfected, matured, established, strengthened, settled. Isn't that the kind of people God wants in His church? Pillars of strength. They're not moved by things. How'd they get that way? They suffered. Not sickness and disease. They've been redeemed from the curse. Suffered what? Not getting their way. They suffered. I know in Phyllis in my own life. I could, I, you know, I could tell you if the Lord let me several different times in our life where, man, I wanted to do something else. There were times I came in and fell across the bed and said, God, please, please, let me do this. Let me go here. Let me do that. And I put in a request for a transfer. <laughs> and it came back, no. denied. <laughs> now, I got a choice. I can rebel and jump out of the will of God and pet my little feelings. Did you hear me? I wish I could express this. I'm believing God will express it to you. Every time that we were so pressed and pushed and so tempted to quit or change or jump, by the grace of God, we, we stayed and we submitted and we did what we were supposed to and what we were told. And right after it, here comes promotion. Every time. Every time. Here comes promotion. Why? You passed a test. Amen. But can you see why so many people are not, have not been promoted? It gets hot in the kitchen and what do they do? Yeah. They lay, I mean, somebody can look at them sideways in church and they won't even come back to church anymore. Much less serve God. People are so weak. They're such whiny babies. Aren't they? So weak. Well, somebody didn't treat me right. Well, who said everybody's going to treat you right? you got to make up your mind. You're going to do what God told you to do if everybody treats you wrong. Amen. And nobody appreciates me. Who said they had to? Right. Who do you serve? See, this is not real to people. They, people are in it for what they can get from other people. and They wear their feelings on their cuff. And you got to make up your mind. I'm going to stay in my post. I'm going to do my duty. If nobody appreciates it, if nobody cares, if nobody treats me right, if, you know, would God lead you to stay in a place where people don't treat you right? Yes, yes. <laughs> well, you shouldn't just answer off the top of your head. Do you know any scripture? I do. First Peter. Go back. You're, you're, you're there, aren't you? I thought I was through. Can you give me a few more minutes here? First Peter. Let's see. Yeah, I got it, but I'm looking for something else. Please stand by. <laughs> I'll read this first. First uh, Peter two, verse thirteen. What does it say? Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Skip on down, verse eighteen. What does it say? Servants, be subject to your master. Some may say, well, thank God slavery's passed away. Just change the word to employee. <laughs> employer. Because really, while you're there, you are their servant in that area. Right? And if, if, if you're volunteering, still, same thing. Not only to the good and gentle, but to who? Did I read that right? Well, now, you know, if people don't treat you right, you don't have to stay. 
But we're having fun today, aren't we? (laughs) Verse 18, are you there? Servants what? Be subject. That's the same word for submit. Submit yourself. Who's going to make you submit? You're going to submit yourself. To your masters, whoever's over you, with all fear, not only to good and gentle people who are over you, but also to what? What is froward? Anybody got any other translations? What does it say? Harsh. Uh, this says, I've got some definitions here. It says, surly. Surly, overbearing, unjust, crooked. Crooked? One said, bearish. What does that mean? These are unpleasant people. Right? And the Bible told you to do what? To unpleasant people? (laughs) Well, that would involve some suffering now, wouldn't it? But you'll find out whether you're committed to God or not. You know? So many times people are led into a situation by the Lord and then they are led out by being offended. And they jump out before they can train and develop. Because, hey, you know the big problem with people? Leaders included. They're like you. (laughs) They're human. They got flesh. They got feelings. And if they're carnal, they can yield to them. But did that change the will of God? Did it change the placement of God and the calls of God because somebody got in the flesh and didn't treat somebody right? Didn't change it. And so if you're going to have the whole will of God in your life, you have to have a face like Flint. And you have to say, "Uh uh-uh, God sent me here and until he releases me, I'm here. If it's a job, right? If it's a ministry, if it's a church, and how about family? I don't love them like I used to. So, that can change. They've been mean to me. So, what's the will of God? What's the will of God? What'd He tell you? Where'd He put you? What'd He place you? You can't control everybody. But you can control yourself. And you can say, well, I'm going to be here. Right? I'm going I'm to hold my place. I'm going to hold the line. So we're still talking about rank, aren't we? When, when you're given orders and you're put in your place, what, what if everybody leave their place? What if the ranks break? You're going to lose. The enemy's going to win. You've got to hold the line. Oh, come on. Can you see this now? You've got to hold the line. And when your team is sent up the hill, you can't back down. You've got to go up the hill. In the things of God, you got to stand your line. You got to hold your line. You got to stand in your place. Right? Is it easy? No. Sometimes it's hard. You may cry. You may feel like you're going to sweat blood. You may plead, God, let me, let me do something else. He says, no, you stand your ground, soldier. What do you do? If you're, if you're true to him, your commitment to, is to him, you'll stand your ground. What will happen to you? After you've suffered a while, here it comes. You'll be perfected. You'll be matured. You'll be strengthened. You'll be established. You'll be settled. You'll be somebody other people can rely on and depend on. You'll be a pillar in the church of your God. Can you say amen? Stand on your feet, please. Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Let's lift our voice and praise the Lord. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Oh, I shall not be. I shall not be moved. 
Father, we pray ere this service conclude that any and every person in this place that has not submitted their life to you and to the Lordship of Jesus, that you would reveal to them their lost condition. Here in this room, by internet, by TV, anyone and everyone, every man, every woman, every young person, that if they died right now, they'd not go to heaven, but they'd go to the awful place, hell. Reveal to them the reality of heaven and hell, eternity, the shortness of this life, and the only way to salvation, Jesus. Draw everyone. Father, I pray also for those like the prodigal son of old. They have been in your house. They have known you and walked with you for a time, but they got away from you. And they let rebellion come up in them and they, they did, they've done their own thing and run far from you. They're not ready to meet you today. Draw them back also. Let them know you love them, you'll forgive them. It can be better than it ever was if they just come back. But they must come back. Draw them, I ask in Jesus' name. With eyes closed, please nobody looking around. Friend, if I'm praying for you, and you know in your heart right now, if you died today you're not confident of what would happen to you you're not sure that you'd go to be with Jesus or maybe you know you're not right friend don't leave this place in that condition this is so serious you you don't know how many more breaths or how many more days you have you should be right with God right now if God's dealing with you if he's dealing with your heart you say yeah brother Keith pray for me God's dealing with me I need to make a move would you raise your hand right now in this place you say yeah brother Keith pray for me Oh, by internet or TV, would you raise your hand? God will see it. And you say, Brother Keith, pray for me. I need to give my life to the Lord. I need to give my heart to Him. Or I need to come back to Him. Either one. If you say, yeah, Brother Keith, pray for me. I need to make a move. I need to come back to Him. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Everybody stand, please. We're going to do it this way. 
There may be some that haven't raised their hand here, but there may be many that are raising their hand there. Let's believe God. Jesus said, or the Spirit of God, I should say, said in Romans that if you believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, you'd be saved. We want to do that right now. And it's not just the words. It's the heart. It's the faith. And it's the commitment. Everybody said out loud, either affirm or reaffirm your faith this morning. And by internet TV, say it out loud right there. Stand up. If you're seated, stand up. Don't, don't stay seated. Stand up right there by your TV or by your uh, uh, computer screen. Say it out loud. Father God, I believe in you. You are the Almighty. My Creator. You are above me. I take my place under you I believe in your son Jesus that he died on the cross paid the full price for all my sins all my failures I believe you've raised him from the dead he's alive right now king of kings lord of lords soon to come again Jesus I give you your place over me. I take my place under you. I confess you are my Lord, my King, my Master, my Savior. As you help me, I will serve you and follow you all my days. I submit to you. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. The Bible said if you do that, you are saved. Your sins are washed away. Condemnation and guilt and shame rolls away. And you stand clean before the Master. Oh, clean by the blood. Clean by the blood. How many would say with the Master today, we read about it, no matter if it hurts, not my will, but your will be done. How many would say that? No matter if it hurts, no matter if I endure some suffering, not getting my way, having to put my flesh under, having to stay when I don't want to stay, having to go when I don't want to go, having to do it when I don't want to do it, having to not do it when I wanted to do it, whatever it is, said out loud, not my will, but your will be done. Hallelujah. Well, I believe this is a good morning. I believe the words in our hearts. It'll not return void. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. I think we ought to just, let's keep singing this on our way out. I shall not be moved. And let's stand at attention now. We're going to be good soldiers, right? Let's, huh? We're going to hold our line. We're going to stay in our place. We don't break rank. We're going to do our job. And the Lord, let the Lord win everything through us. You're dismissed as we sing. Oh, I shall